sorry. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be reading uh, from Genesis chapter 22. We've been preaching the last few weeks. Last week, of course, we had Brother Bob Anderson here, and we're going to have him back uh, uh, when the time is right. But uh, we've been preaching about rebuilding the altar. How many people remember when we started this a few weeks ago, we said we're building the altar. You remember when you first got saved, or maybe some of you here never been saved, but when you first went to the cross and you knelt at the cross and you asked Jesus to forgive your sins and, and you asked uh, Christ to come into your life and you became a born-again believer, a follower of Jesus. didn't have anything to do with joining any church, but it had to do with establishing a relationship. You became a child of God through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. That was a place where your, your spiritual life began, and that was like an altar that you built. And we had talked about in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, we read about uh, people that build altars uh, at different places, different times when they had an encounter with God. I thank God that we have a God who is not afar off, but he, we have a God that wants, to, wants you to have an encounter with Him. And the only way we can have an encounter with Him is through faith. We need to believe that He is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's what the Word says. And He wants to have an encounter with you. He wants you to get Him to know. Uh, he wants you to get to know Him personally. Yeah, a lot of other religions have a God that's way off there and it's way off on another planet somewhere and this and that. But we have a God that wants to get to know you personally, and wants you wants to, you to get to know Him. In chapter 22, we read about a guy named Abraham. We've all heard of Abraham, if you know anything about the word. Abraham was considered the father of the faithful. In fact, when the Apostle Paul in the New Testament wanted to explain salvation, he didn't talk about Peter, he didn't talk about James or John, he went all the way back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis and said, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's faith. Abraham is an example of saving faith. And in chapter 22, we read about a story that is really kind of a pivotal story in the Word because, again, the New Testament writers refer to this story as a foundation for what we believe. We know that God promised Abraham... When he was living in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, he says, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your city. Take your wife and uh, your servants with you. And I want you to go to a place I'm going to show you. And when you get there, I'm going to establish you. And I'm going to give you an offspring. I'm going to give you a progeny that's going to be like the, the stars in the sky or the sand in the sea. That means you're going to have offspring. You're going to have children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren. They're going to populate. They're going to be everywhere. Now the only problem was Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren. She didn't have any children. She couldn't have children. But when Abraham was 99 and Sarah was 89, God said, Abraham, you're going to have a son. And Abraham laughed. And Sarah laughed. They laughed. They said, 89 years old. I don't know. Now, now, Miss Jane, just imagine if somebody came up to you and said, Miss Jane, you're going to have a... <laughs> Y'all had a pretty good laugh at that one, didn't you? And Miss Jane is back there saying, well, not me. <laughs> I already did that. But 89 years old. And she had a son. And they named the son Isaac because Isaac means laughter. And Isaac was... The only begotten son of Abraham. He had another son named Ishmael from another woman, but that's, that's another story. That wasn't the son of promise. Isaac was the son of promise. Isaac was the one through whom the promise would be fulfilled. Now, chapter 22 and verse 1. And it came to pass that after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now that word tempt, a lot of people will read that. And think, well, there's God trying to make Abraham sin. That's not what it may, means at all. Because when we think of temptation, what do we think of? You know, I can resist, resist anything but temptation, right? It's, it's attempting to sin. But that's not what it means here. The word here means it's the same thing that whenever they get gold. If you get a piece of gold and they'll check it to see how pure it is. 
They'll test it. They'll test it to see if it's 24 karat or 12 karat or whatever. Well, this, this word tempting, it, it really refers to what they would do to test metals to see how pure they were. You know, uh, Czar and myself and Todd, you know, we work at Allegheny London Steel Corporation, Dale. And, you know, when they, when they pour that whole hot molten metal, they always take some in, in, a little, in a little container and they take it to the lab to test it to make sure it's, it's what it's supposed to be. And that's what this word tempt means. God wanted to try. He wanted to test Abraham. He wanted to see what was in Abraham. And see, here's the thing. I want you to listen to me. God knew what Abraham was going to do. But he wanted Abraham to prove it to everybody else. He was giving Abraham a chance to show the whole world what faith was all about. Because God knew what Abraham was going to do. He knew Abraham. Now listen to what he said. He says, after these things, uh, God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham... And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. God said, I want you to take this son, which is your only son. He's the son of promise. He's the son through whom all your offspring are going to come. I want you to take him and take him up on top of a mountain, I'm going to show you, and offer him up to me as a sacrifice. Now somebody says, human sacrifice? God of the Bible? A human sacrifice? Abraham didn't say, excuse me, Lord. But this son, you said this son was going to be the father of many nations. And you want me to sacrifice him to you? Lord, are you sure? Let me pray about it. Maybe that's not God. Maybe I've got to pray about this for a few weeks. If it was me, I'd be praying about it for a long time. But Abraham was a man of faith. So he didn't pray about it. He didn't argue with it. He just said, let's go. He said, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Mount Moriah. How many people know where Mount Moriah is? Got a good guess? You won't necessarily find it on a modern-day map. But I'll tell you where Mount Moriah is. That place in Jerusalem they call the Temple Mount, where they have, that, they have that mosque up there now, and the Jews want to build a temple there. That's where Abraham took his son. That's Mount Moriah. Now listen to what he says. He says in verse 4, On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. So he said, wait a minute, Abraham. You're going up there to offer your son as a sacrifice. Do you think you're going to bring him back with, with you? See, here's what Abraham believed. Some people might say, well, maybe Abraham thought that God was going to change his mind. Maybe Abraham thought that, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, God was going to say, okay, you know, uh, you've come this far. Oh, it's all right. Let's go. But that's not the fact. If you go to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, you know what it says there? You know why Abraham was willing to offer his son on the altar of sacrifice? Because he believed that God could raise him from the dead. Abraham fully expected to take his son, to put him on the altar and plunge that knife into him and offer a sacrifice. And he believed that God would be able to raise him back again from the dead. He believed in the resurrection. So he told the young men, he says, we'll be back. You just wait here. It says in verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac said, Dad, uh, and Abraham said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Well, there's the fire, and here's the wood for the altar, but where's the offering? Where is the lamb for a burnt offering. This term, burnt offering, you read this a lot in the Old Testament. In the, when God gave the law to Moses, which was hundreds of years after this, he prescribed a burnt offering. When they talk about the burnt offering, it was voluntary. When they would bring the burnt offering, it would be completely consumed. In other words, they wouldn't keep part of it for the priest. And it had to be the highest quality. 
the finest. You couldn't just pick, you couldn't find a lamb in the flock that was kind of, you know, that was limping or maybe had one eye. Or they, they had to get the best they could find, unblemished, and bring it. And here's Isaac saying, Dad, we got the fire, we got the wood, but what are we going to use for an offering? Listen to what Abraham said. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. He said, God will provide the lamb. Please get the picture because we're talking about building an altar here. We're talking about building a place of remembrance, a place of worship, a place of encounter that Abraham was about to do. On the way up to that top of that mountain, Abraham fully expected that when he would get to the top of that mountain, he would plunge his knife into his son's heart and light the fire and consume him as a worship offering to his God. He said this, And they came to the place where God had told him of, and Abraham, what did he do? He built an altar there. And he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took his knife to slay his son. I mean, Abraham meant business. He believed God. And he fully expected to, to, to slay his son, and he knew God would raise him back from the dead. Listen to what happened. And while he's there at that altar... An angel spoke, a messenger from God. The angel of the Lord, probably the pre-incarnate Christ himself. He called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham. And Abraham said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. We see here a wonderful picture of what God has done for us. We see here a picture thousands of years before Christ of what God was preparing for everyone who would put their faith in him and who would come to the altar of the cross. Whereas I deserved to hang on that cross for my sins, instead God had provided a lamb. The spotless lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. His name is Jesus. He took our punishment. He took our shame. He took our judgment on that cross. When, when Abraham was ready to plunge his knife into his son's heart, God said, stop. i got a substitute. i got something else for you. In essence, Isaac was raised from the dead. <laughs> He never died, really, but he was as good as dead. But God spared him, and he provided a substitute. That substitute he provided for Isaac, he provided for you and for me. See, that's the gospel message. That's the gospel message. The judgment that should be mine, Christ took on him. So that the life that was his can now be mine. Listen. Listen. Abraham called the name of that place, what? Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. That word Jehovah Jireh, we can translate that Jehovah, the God who provides. The God who will see to it. He's the God who has provided for us a substitute to take our sins. Now when we talk about an altar... Remember, we said it's a place of worship. Abraham said to, his, to the fellows he left behind, he says, we're going to worship God. It's a place where we tell God how much he means to us. We're willing to give whatever it takes to give to him whatever, whatever uh, we need to express to him how much he means. What does God mean to you? What are you let me ask you this. What are you not willing to give up for the Lord? What in your life is more important than your relationship with him. It might not be anything that looks bad on the outside. It could be something inconsequential. But what is it? See, true worship 
isn't about singing. I thank God we have a worship team and we lift our hands and sing and praise God. That's wonderful that we can do that. That's worship. That's praise and worship. That's good. But real worship is what are you willing to give? Abraham was willing to give his son. He went to worship God. That altar was a place of worship. It was a place of sacrifice. It was a place where he had an encounter with God, a face-to-face, -face, a spirit-to-spirit -spirit encounter with God. God spoke to him. And it was a place of remembrance because he gave it a name. On top of that mountain today in the city of Jerusalem is a place that says, I will provide. I am the Lord that will provide. I am the Lord that will see to it. You see, Abraham named that spot, and it stays today with that name. Jehovah Jireh. The God that provides. The God that will see to it. The God that will keep his promise. No matter what it takes. He'll keep his promise. He'll keep his promise. Now listen. God tried Abraham. He tempted him. He tested him. And listen, Abraham tested God. Because Abraham realized, see, he knew, he knew God was going to keep his promise. See, he knew, he knew that God would do what he said he was going to do. So he said, well, you know what? I believe God. If he tells me to offer my son, I'll offer it. And God said, he's going to find some way to bring my son back to life. Because he said he was going to be the one through whom the world would be blessed. I want to ask you something. What has God promised you? What are you holding on to God's promises for? I want you to look at one scripture, one more scripture with me in the New Testament. Because I want to I want to bring it home because we've been talking about rebuilding the altar where you started your, your faith walk. And if maybe there's somebody here that never started their faith walk, we want to give you the opportunity to. Okay? Turn over to Romans. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 12. Come on, you all know it. You Bible scholars out there, you know what Romans chapter 12 says, don't you? Is somebody saying all that stuff in the Old Testament, that's Old Testament? God, God doesn't want me, I can't build an altar. If I build an altar in my backyard, the city of New Kensington come around and <laughs> give me a ticket. I ain't allowed to burn stuff in my backyard. They see me burning something on, uh, burning an animal in my backyard, they'll, they'll come up and arrest me for, you know, animal cruelty. We can't do that anymore. But that's not what it's about. Here's what it's about. Chapter 12 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes this, I beseech you therefore, brother. Well, let's, let's, let's just back up, because when we see a therefore, it's always good to go back up a little bit in, in chapter 11 and verse 34. Who has known the mind of the Lord, the Apostle Paul says, or who has been his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Who, is there, who, who does God owe anything to? See, there's a lot of folks... We have this entitlement mentality. We figure the government owes us stuff. We figure God owes us some stuff too. God doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't owe us anything. God doesn't need our advice. He doesn't need counselors. He doesn't need, you know, a cabinet to tell him what to do. He doesn't need a legal advisor. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to, and whatever he wants to do is right, because he's God. So who can, who can he come to? Who, who? Who can, who can uh, you know, tell God, that, well, you know, Lord, I think you messed up on this one. Have you ever done that? God, I think maybe you've kind of missed this one. God doesn't miss anything, believe me. We've missed the boat a few times, but God hasn't. All right, now listen to what he says. Therefore, I beseech you, the Apostle Paul writes, to believers, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present your bodies a what? A living Sacrifice. Wait a minute. You, you mean you want me to lay on an altar and have somebody stick a knife in? That's not what it has. A living sacrifice. God doesn't need dead sacrifices. If you're dead, you can't do anything for him. He needs a living sacrifice. 
He needs people who are willing to have as much faith as Abraham had to, to put themselves on the altar. Listen to what it says. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may what? Prove God. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will? You say, oh God, what do you want for my life? Anybody ever say that? God, what do you want from me? God, what do you want? What do you have for me? What gifts have you given me? What, how do you want me to operate? What do, you want, what do you want me to do for you, Lord? What? You want to find that out? Go up to the top of the mountain. Bring yourself to the altar. And offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Not partially. Because remember, we talked about that burnt offering they were talking about. It had to be consumed entirely. God doesn't want a couple hours a week. He doesn't even want one or two days a week. He wants you 24-7. He wants you to be His and His alone. And to make that sacrifice, our sister gave that word this morning, it costs something. It costs everything. To make yourself a living Sacrifice to go back and rebuild the altar. If you want to stand when the rain comes, Jesus said those who build upon a, a, a rock and there are those who build upon a shaky foundation. Listen, you need to present yourself a living sacrifice. And you can prove God. You can find out. You can, you, when, you hear, when you think you hear God's voice, how many people have had the experience, you felt God had told you something and it blows up in your face? Well, if you haven't, I have. <laughs> and I look back on those times, and I think to myself, I wonder, I wonder if I was sold out to him. I wonder if maybe he, maybe if I had been a little more, a little more uncompromising. Maybe if I had been a little more fervently seeking him, maybe I would have heard something that I didn't hear. Because you know what? The enemy's a pretty good deceiver. He can make himself, he can make himself sound like, look like an angel of light. You know what I'm saying? Huh? He comes looking good. Is it saying the right word? You know, with an anointing? Boom. Not every anointing comes from the Holy Spirit. I got news for you. It's quiet in here this morning. I don't know what that is, but... It's good. Not every anointing was a, mm, I feel the anointing. You better make sure it's from the Holy Spirit because the evil spirit can give you an anointing too. <laughs> okay, now listen. Okay. We can prove God. He, it's okay. Yeah, he doesn't mind it. We can test him. You know that? We can. He said, try me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Test me. Make yourself Present yourself a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know, he's trying us right now as believers. In this time we're living in, there are so many different options. There's so many different things that we hear and things that we can fall into and different kinds of churches and congregations we can go to and different kinds of things we can get mixed up. You can go to a prophet school and you can go to healing school and you can go to all this other stuff. And it sounds good and it looks good and they use the Bible sometimes and they, you know, they have, mm, they feel kind of ooh, like there's something. But you know what? We need to test everything. We need to present our bodies. We need to say, Lord, here I am. Before we go to any church, before we get involved, we need to say, here, I, I'm, I want everything. How many can remember? I can go back to where I first got saved, man. I gave him everything. You remember that? And as time went on, I just started feeling myself kind of getting some of them things back. You know, we talked about the altars that we built, the strongholds we've allowed to be established in our lives. Mm hmm Man, take us back to the altar. Rebuild the altar. Get back to the place where we first began. We're going to read this and we're going to close. He says, make yourself, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, holy, set apart, 
set apart, peculiar, different, not like the world. He's not interested in trying to attract people into the church by making the church look like the world. I can get myself in trouble, but I'm not going to say anything. He says, holy, acceptable unto God. What makes us acceptable in the eyes of God? How can he accept us? If I wear the right suit? If I put a tie on? Nothing wrong with suit and tie. Don't misunderstand. If I, you know, if I drive the right car. You know what makes us acceptable to God? The blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Christ. The only way he can accept us is by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way he can, he can call us his sons and daughters. It's not membership in the church or any of that. It's faith in God. It's faith in what Jesus did on the cross. Acceptable. It's your reasonable surface. It was only reasonable that Abraham would be willing to offer his son. It sounds crazy to us. But to Abraham, he believed God. Now listen, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Do you know what that, what that word conformed? It means like being pressed into a mold. Any of you ever grow up, and some of you are old, old enough to remember Play-Doh? You remember Play-Doh? And you get Play-Doh, and they would give you these little molds, and you make a little fish, and make a little thing, press them in there, and make the Play-Doh look like whatever. They still have that stuff? Some of you guys, they still got, okay. <laughs> or, or Silly Putty. They still have Silly Putty. You know, you put it on a, on a comic strip and pull it up and the comic strip would be there. And that was kind of cool, but I could never figure out what the purpose of that was. Because <laughs> it was backwards, you couldn't read it. But that, that doesn't matter. All right, now, conformed means, means the world wants to take you and wants to press you into a mold and make you look just like you can. Ladies, thank you for coming. God bless you all. They have to leave. It's good to have you with us. Come back again. Thank you, Patrick. Bring it back again. Hallelujah. Thank you, ladies. God bless. Patrick has to get them back to, uh, to where they come from. God bless you. Please come again. We love you. Thank you. It wants to press you into the mold. It wants to make you look like, it, like, like the world. And, and I'm, I'm afraid that the church has been pressed into the mold. The church in the United States, we've allowed ourselves to be pressed into the mold. So we just look like any other, you know, any other thing going on. And uh, maybe we'll get some folks to come in if we make them feel comfortable and make them feel like they're just, you know, going to watch a game or something. We'll just, we'll just press them in. But the Word tells us not to be conformed. But it tells us to be what? To be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, before I go on, I want to pray for them girls that was in here. Because, you know what, they need to know the Lord. I hope that maybe something they heard just in these few minutes that we're here. I, I, so one of them, one of them will just say, I, I need Jesus. Father, we want to pray for these, these young ladies that were in here this morning. Father, I pray, God, that you would allow your spirit to take whatever they've heard this morning and plug it into their spirit, Father. I pray that you would anoint the words that were spoken, that seeds had been planted, Father, that one of them might, when they get back to where they're going, they, one of them might call out and say, Jesus, I need you. They might call upon the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. That we might be transformed or what? Changed. God doesn't want us to be pressed into the mold that the world wants to put us in. He wants us to be changed. He wants us to be transformed. He wants our minds to be renewed. See, that's the living sacrifice. That's the encounter. That's the worship. That's the place of remembrance. When God changed my mind, how many people, he changed my mind. Nobody else could. You ever try to change somebody's mind? They usually don't listen to you. But God can change your mind. He can change your mind. How many people said, God, I need you to change my mind? I want to go back and rebuild the altar. See, I'm believing God. Listen. I'm believing God that we're on the edge of a breakthrough. That as individuals and as a body, 
but we've got to go back. We're not going to, listen, we're not going to get it if we keep trying to do things the way the world says we ought to do things. There was a guy that came to church one time, a long time ago. And the guy used to be a door-to-door -door salesman, right? And he came in with, the, he had his girlfriend, they were older, an older couple, they were coming. And he came in, and he came up to me, he says, he says, Pastor, he says, I know how to sell things. He says, and, and you need a good marketing plan. I said, I don't need no marketing plan. I need the Holy Spirit. I need to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. It's not, listen, we're not trying to sell something. We're trying to present what everybody needs to hear. That we're lost and dying and going to hell. And our only hope is faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. I can't sell that. You can't package that. You can't market that. We don't need other books to tell us. It's right here. Present yourself a living sacrifice. Climb up to that mountain and crawl on the altar. And allow God to do some surgery on that heart. And some, some brainwashing. I need to be brainwashed <laughs> by the Holy Spirit. Not by no church or by no man. I need to be brainwashed by the Holy Spirit. I need to have my mind cleansed. And I need, when, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm going through this process, and I see all these strongholds, these altars I have built in my life, I need to tear them down and cast them down in the name of Jesus. And when the imagination and the thoughts come, I need to cast them down and bring them, bring them captive. I need to arrest my thinking by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't let my mind wander. Come on, you ever going to let your mind wander? Sit back, especially when we're chilling. You know, especially when you're like relaxing. You're in the old recliner chair, you know. Anybody got a recliner chair? You got to be sitting back in a recliner chair. Like this. And your mind just starts, you're like kind of half awake and half asleep. You just start thinking about, ah. Man, we need to take them thoughts. And we need to cast them down. In the name of Jesus. And take control. And let the Holy Spirit take control. Because, listen, I'm not doing this just to call myself a reverend. I'm not, you know, I don't go to church. Just, we don't go to church just to, just to check out the folks. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit. You need God to come and cleanse you and make you whole and make you new and, and, and conform and transform your mind by the washing, by the uh, washing and the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants you to know what he has for your life. But you ain't going to find out until you get to that altar. Until you make yourself a living sacrifice. How many people can remember when they first crawled on that altar? I was a living sacrifice. And somehow we get, see ourselves getting off <laughs> that altar. I want to get back. I want to get back to where I first began. That's kind of like a thing you're going to hear from me over and over again because that's what I'm, that's what I'm <laughs> trying to do. How many want to go back? Maybe you've never been there to begin with. I don't know. You know, a lot of these young ladies, I was, I was actually praying about doing an altar call while they was here. <laughs> but I said, well, no, I said, we'll, do, we'll just plant the word. And, you know, Pat will bring them back. We'll just plant the seeds in their lives. Pray for them. But now, between you and the Lord now, I want to go back to the altar. I want to get back to that place where nothing made any difference except what God wanted. When the distractions will come, you know what I found out? When, when God gets ready to bless, all hell breaks loose. Come on. Come on. See, that's how, I, that's, how, that's how I know God's getting ready to do something. Because <laughs> it seems like it's breaking loose everywhere. That's all right. I don't care. Let him. Let Satan go ahead. Let him come in like a flood. Because when he does, the Lord will raise up a standard. This is Jehovah Jireh here today. This is Mount Moriah here today. How many are willing to put their, put their bodies on the altar today? 
not for my sake or for the sake of the church or anybody or your husband or wife or brother, but for you, for you, you and God. This is between you and him. You want to put your bodies on the altar today. I want to ask you to stand with me if you would.